I bring you greetings in the name of Christ Jesus our Lord in whose name we have gathered together this day to worship him to fellowship with one another and to meditate his holy word I want to really thank God for the privilege that is mine to bring God's word to you on two Fridays beginning with this Friday and then four evenings thank you brother Abraham for reminding me of my association and involvement in the ministry of the Bread of Life Fellowship since its inception. I remember the time when I visited this fellowship and it was a small cottage prayer cell in the residence of uh, Dr. Lilly and that was the late uh, 70s and ever since every time I have visited this uh, fellowship more than giving the word of God to those who gathered for these meetings, I was very personally refreshed. Several times I have visited you with my wife, and I really thank God for the privilege that we could renew our fellowship during this visit. I really want to thank God the way the meetings are called. They are not called a convention. Sometimes when you say convention, it becomes too conventional. And it is not called evangelistic meetings because I am not an evangelist. If somebody invites me for an evangelistic crusade, I bluntly and flatly tell them, please don't call me, invite somebody else because I am not called to be an evangelist. But they would still insist that I should come. Then because they insist and they compel and force me, I go there only to prove that I am not an evangelist. So basically, my calling is to be a Bible teacher. From day one of my salvation in 1962, the great burden in my heart has been to minister the word of God to the members of the body of Christ, to edify them, to exhort them, to encourage them, and to rebuke them, and convince, and also to correct wherever it is necessary. That is why in almost all my teaching programs and in all that I present from God's Word either through writing or through pulpits or through media it always will have a corrective content because I believe that is the specific calling that God has given me so these meetings are called revival meetings revival I would like to begin with a prayer that the psalmist has offered thrice on that particular request in Psalm 119. Please turn your Bibles. It is necessary that in all the meetings that you would attend during the course of this week, you bring your Bibles and perhaps this morning, if you have not brought a copy of your Bible, I would very much request you and urge you to please look at the Bible of your neighbor. And if your neighbor also has forgotten to bring his or her Bible, I won't mind if you change your seats. And it is a must that you switch off your cell phones. Don't even keep them in the vibration mode. That's the minimum respect and reverence we can show towards the preaching and the reception of God's Word. This is God speaking to us. Turn with me to book of Psalms 119. I'll begin with verse 25. Here is the psalmist. We do not know who exactly wrote Psalm 119. Several people say it was David who wrote. But because that is not so crystal clearly pointed out, we would simply say the psalmist. We have it in verse 25. My soul clings to the dust. Revive me according to your word. Revival according to God's word. The emphasis is revival according to God's word. Now come along with me of the same psalm, verse 107. I am afflicted very much. Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. Once again, revive me, O Lord, according to your word. Now come with me to verse 154. Plead my cause and redeem me. Revive me according to your word. So this is not just a casual mention, but there is an eternal truth that goes behind it. 
any revival that is not patterned after and promoted by the preaching of God's word will not fulfill God's intended purposes for which that revival was sent. That is why several revivals have come in church history and most of them died out or disappear before they accomplished the purpose for which God sent that awakening because it was not rooted on God's word. So these meetings, I very much would like to imprint it on your minds that this revival that we are looking forward to is not just going to be an excitement or exuberance, though it might be there, but basically it will be a time when God through his word will deal with each of us on a personal level, at a family level, and corporately at the church level. So much so, that revival will have a lasting effect. It will have a lasting, abiding fruitfulness. With that introduction, I would like to move on to my message. You noticed during the last two, three minutes, there was one thing I kept emphasizing, the word. Revive me, O God, according to your word. Your word. Now, beloved, these are days when there is revival reported everywhere from several corridors of the church and from several cross-sections of Christianity. But one thing that is very sadly missing in most of these revivals is the restoration or bringing back of God's word to its due place. There is a revival of worship, there is a revival of praise and thanksgiving, adoration, singing, and all that goes with that word worship. Worship is important. But God has placed his word even above his name. If you turn with me to Psalm 138, I will read to you the second verse. Psalm 138 two. I will worship toward your holy temple, and praise your name. That's about worship. For your loving kindness and your truth. It doesn't stop there. It is all because you have magnified your word above all your name. Worship is actually a byproduct of an understanding of the word. Worship is actually a response to what we understand from the word about God. In other words, it is word first. And response to that word is worship next. So there again, we see the word. Now there is another revival that goes everywhere in the ministry, in the work of the Lord. Those were days that only the paid clergy used to do all the ministry. But these days, lots of people, lots of Christians, they try to do a ministry of their own. They get very active in the things of God. They want to do this or that for the kingdom of God and for the glory of God. So there is a revival in God's work also, nevertheless. Nevertheless, our work is not going to impress God. Our work, whatever sort and magnitude it is, that's not going to impress God. You know what is going to impress God? Turn with me to the book of Isaiah. I will read to you the first two verses of the last chapter, even the 66th chapter. I'll read the first two verses to you. Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What is the house that you will build me? What is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made, and all those things exist, says the Lord. In other words, God says, if I sit in the heaven, my feet touch the earth. I'm such a huge, big God. You can't box me or house me, or you cannot accommodate me into a small house that you are building. Maybe it's a big temple, a big house according to human standards. But you can't just house me into a small box. I'm just beyond all this. Whatever you are trying to do, all these things have been from the beginning. You are not going to impress me by whatever you do. But, look at the second words, second portion. But, on this one will I look. You know that word but is important. But on this one I will look. On him who is poor and of a contrite spirit, who 
trembles at my word. See, your worship is not going to impress God, but your response to God's word is what God is interested in. Number two, your work, whatever sort, that's not going to impress God, but if you tremble at God's word, that alone is going to get God's attention and God will be pleased to look into you. So much so, I want to really commit myself in the presence of the Lord right at the beginning of this program. That during the next, during these six talks, two on Fridays and four in the evenings, that I would totally stand to preach from here the pure word of God, which would revive each of you to such an extent that you get nearer to God and you would live a life that will absolutely please Him and whatever you want to attempt to do for Him will be acknowledged by God in His presence. That's the commitment with which I'm going to minister to you from this moment onwards. Today, my topic is on how the Word of God has to affect us at every stage of our lives, every stage of our Christian lives. I want to begin with a very interesting character because that character we would be referring to especially during the last week of the Lenten season. You know the 40 days that uh, is presently we are going through is called the Lenten season according to the traditional church calendar. That goes 40 days before the Good Friday, that is the, uh, the day of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And one person who would be very often quoted, sometimes with kindness, many times with a lot of harshness, that is the character called Simon Peter. You go to any church during the Passion Week, Simon Peter, they would be, he would be finished and fired everywhere. Now, I would like to just begin with that character because he has got lots of message to give to us. You know, there were two people who did not act the way Jesus Christ wanted them to act. One was Simon Peter. Perhaps he was the senior most member of the 12-member cabinet of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the other was the financial secretary of the 12 member cabinet that is Judas Iscariot. Now I bring these two candidates because they were holding outstanding significant positions in that team of the Lord Jesus Christ. One fellow said, I know Jesus, I will show him to you, come on, catch him. The other fellow said, Jesus, I don't know him. Jesus, cursed be him. No, 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 I told you, I don't know that fellow at all. Be gone. Now, I want to just present before you and ask you an objective question. Between the sin of Judas Iscariot and the sin of Simon Peter, which one you think was of the worst sort? The one who said, I know Jesus, I'll show him to you. Or the one who said, I don't know Jesus, Cursed be him. Come on, give me an objective answer. Don't give me a traditional answer. <laughs> Obviously, if you look at it very objectively, the sin of Simon Peter was more grievous, gruesome, and it was more harness compared to the sin of Judas Iscariot. But the end of the story is more important than the beginning of the story. In the end of the story, one fellow was totally out and the other fellow was not, not only in, but he was just lifted up to higher ground, to higher position. Why? One fellow, when he realized what he had done, he immediately ran to the religion. He immediately ran to the priest. He immediately ran to the temple and he hanged himself. The other fellow, you know what he did? Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26. And I will read to you verse 75. It is a very long chapter. Matthew 26. This is uh, towards the end of this uh, Gospel narrative. 
and I'll read to you verse 75. Then Peter remembered the word of Jesus. If you have a habit of underlining your Bibles, underline that word, word. Peter remembered the word of Jesus who said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Then he went out and wept bitterly. One fellow went to religion and he was damned. Other fellow remembered the word, he was saved. Beloved, at any point of your Christian life, how you remember the word and then how you respond to the word, that will not only decide, that will not only determine, that will seal your destiny. Now I want you to be very, very clear on this point. Now Peter, not only on this so-called backsliding that he went through, Several other times, Peter had a special place for God's word in his life. How do I say that? He was an expert fisherman. He was toiling and moiling whole night, but he caught nothing. Then came Jesus. Jesus wanted to preach the word because multitudes were thronging unto him to hear the word. Jesus did not have a ready-made pulpit, so he got a mobile pulpit, and that mobile pulpit was the boat of Simon Peter. That's important. So Simon Peter was asked to just, uh, uh, just launch the boat in, and then Jesus Christ got on the boat, and he started preaching. And he told Peter, throw the net into the deep waters. Or other gospel narrative says, throw it on the right side. Just try to imagine what all imagination Peter would have gone through. I am an expert fisherman. He is an inexperienced carpenter. At the maximum, he can make a boat. He can't swim a boat. What does he know about fishing? And he is saying that throw it on the right side. As if so long I was throwing it on the wrong side. I have tried all night, but I didn't catch anything. But you know what Peter said? Master, whole night I have been trying. I was not successful. Nevertheless, at your word, I throw the net. You know, all your experience and all your knowledge and all your expertise and well, acumen, whatever, name it what. When it is the word of God, you just bring it down there and you get the greatest miracle catch of your life. There was another instance. Jesus Christ was talking about taking the words of life and he said, my flesh and my, my, my blood and my words. And that was a very confusing doctrine for them. If you read the John 6 chapter, you will be confused like any other theology. It's a very difficult chapter. John's gospel, 6th chapter, it's a very difficult chapter. If you read it once, it looks easy. If you read it twice, you find how difficult it is to understand. And from that time, the disciples, several of them, one by one, they started leaving the Lord Jesus Christ. They started deserting Him. Only a few were left. Jesus was not going panic as some of the political party leaders of these days. He was not panicky. He was not excited. One by one people were going. Jesus also had always a sense of humor. So there were these 12 guys standing before him. And Jesus said, Hey guys, would you also like to go? You know, he was perfectly at peace. He was perfectly relaxed. Would you also like to go? And it was Simon Peter, the usual spokesman of the 12 member team. You know what he said? Where shall we go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. In other words, everything else we can get elsewhere. But the words of eternal life, it's with you. We don't want to leave you. Beloved, like this, I would like you to go through the life of Simon Peter. You find the word of God was not only prominent, it was also preeminent in his life. Now, that's what really fascinated me when I was going through the first and the second epistles of Peter. Keep your Bibles open. That's what we are going to study today. 
first and second epistles of Peter. When you find time, I'm sure you will have time today after the service is over till you report to work tomorrow morning. Try to go through these two epistles. If you have a spiritual discernment, your spirit and heart would begin to dance within yourselves, finding the place that God, that Peter, Simon Peter, had given to the word of God in his life. You will find, beginning with salvation, follow my words carefully, beginning with salvation, going through the sojourning of Christian life until you come to the second coming of Christ, you find the word of God has to affect every phase and aspect of our lives. I have pointed out and I was able to call out seven stages of our Christian life where the word of God has to play a singular role. The first one is in First Peter, first chapter, verses 23 to 25. That speaks about our spiritual rebirth. That speaks about our born again experience. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God. Beautiful. How are we born again? We are born again by the incorruptible word, incorruptible seed. What is that seed? That is the word of God. What is the quality of that word? It lives and abides forever. It just makes an appearance and disappears. It lives and abides forever. And that is given an illustration. All flesh is as grass. What is flesh? All humankind. The best of brain in the world included. All flesh is as grass. And all the glory of man, his inventions, his accomplishments, whatever he is able to produce by his brain power, all the glory of man, it is just the flower of the grass. The grass withers and its flower falls away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. What is that word? This is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. How are we born again? Did you ever try to understand it? We are not born again because we went through some motions of repentance or reconciliation and water baptism and then uh, people laying their hands on us. They were all other, they are all the uh, circumferential things. But what is the central thing? How were we born again? Without a seed, no baby will be born. How are we born again? We are born again by the incorruptible seed. What is that seed? There is the word of God. But that looks very abstract. Born again by the word of God. What does it mean? I'll tell you. We believed in the gospel and we were saved. What is the gospel? Christ died. How do you know Christ died? Some people say Christ escaped to Kashmir. How do you say that Christ died? And Christ was buried. And you say Christ rose again. How do you know Christ rose again? Don't tell me there is an empty tomb there in, in Israel. There are two empty tombs. One is Roman Catholic tomb and the other is Protestant tomb. Which tomb? Maybe if you want to have another tomb, you can have an interdenominational tomb. Which tomb? Empty tomb in which tomb? How do you know? Who photographed it? Who knew? How do you know that Jesus died? How do you know that Jesus was buried? I'm just shaking up a little bit. Because you won't wither away. Because you are born again by the word. But how do we know? How do we know the historicity of the gospel? Because the Bible says, the Bible says that Christ died. The Bible says that Christ was buried. The Bible says that Christ rose again. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15th chapter. Beloved, I'm just also getting into some important material that you need to uh, keep in mind constantly in your Christian walk. 1 Corinthians 15th chapter. I will read to you the first five verses. Moreover, brothers, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you. 
which you also received and in which you also stand by which you also were saved if you hold fast that word which I preached you underline that word that word that gospel that word I delivered to you first of all which I also received that Christ died for our sins that's an incomplete sentence Christ died for our sins according to the scripture that's very important underline that that is theology that's the right understanding of the gospel Christ died for our sins how do I know that according to the scriptures and he was buried and that he rose again the third day how do you know according to the scriptures I am born again because I believed what the Bible said that Christ died that Christ was buried that Christ rose again and then Christ is coming again it is all that what the Word of God says did you ever realize it this is why it is important that we go through the Gospels as often as possible we, should, we never pass out of the necessity of studying the Gospels it is there in the historicity of the gospel that our faith stands or falls you shake that up the whole thing is gone so we are born again by that incorruptible seed that is the word of God someday you feel as if you are mightily saved and next day you feel you are miserably lost isn't it isn't it I call it Malayalam experience one day you are up on Malay next day you are down in Alam one day you are up on the mountain, next day you are down in the ditch. You know, that wavy thing. Up and down. One day, the feelings are just mounting high. Next day, it's all down. It's, uh, the, the, the wing is gone, the feathers are shed, nothing left. It is here, beloved. I want you to remember. Yes, step number one, two, three. First it is fact, next it is faith, and third and third alone is feeling. Say that again. First it is fact, the fact of the gospel, the fact of your salvation, the fact of your restoration with Christ, the fact of your fellowship with God, the fact of your sins being forgiven, the fact that your name is written in the book of life, the fact that you have fellowship with God the Father and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the fact that the Holy Spirit indwells you. That's a fact. It's an externally established fact. That cannot be changed. That cannot be altered. The constancy of the fact. You believe it, that comes faith. Even if you don't believe it, the fact doesn't change. What if some don't believe? Will their unbelief make the word of God of none effect? No. Let every man and woman in the world disbelieve the Lord Jesus Christ. Still, the word will stand forever. You can't add anything to the word of God. Your, your faith is not going to add verity to God's word. It's the other way around. So first fact, then comes faith. And then depending upon your psychological makeup, there comes feeling. One fellow, when he gets his plus two results, he jumps to the roof. The other fellow would have got even a higher mark than the fellow who jumped to the roof, but he'll be sitting. Oh, is it so? But the fact is the same. His emotional response, his feelings may change. But fact is always established. So we are born again by the word of God that according to the scriptures, Christ died, he was buried, and again you have to use that phrase according to the scriptures he rose again hallelujah this is the word that is near your mouth this is the word of God and this is the word of the pure gospel people talk about full gospel I don't believe in full gospel or half gospel I believe in pure gospel the gospel in a nutshell is what Paul has defined for us, not explained, defined for us in Rome, 1 Corinthians 15 chapter, first three verses or five verses which I just now read out to you. Secondly, after the birth, naturally comes growth. 
That's stage number two. First spiritual birth and then spiritual growth. First Peter, second chapter. We just uh, finished reading that first chapter, the concluding lines. Now Peter talks about growth. Having talked about birth in the first chapter, he talks about growth in the next chapter. We'll read the first three verses. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all guile, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes, you are just born again, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. First is birth. Now he talks about growth. Birth is by the word of God and growth is also only by the word of God. How is it? Did you notice something there? Before talking about desiring the sincere milk of the word, he's saying that you leave certain things out. You know, Christian life is always leaving and cleaving. Christian life, if you want to use, uh, you want to have me use uh, the, the chemistry terms, it is breaking of old bonds and making of new bonds. That's what the Christian chemistry is all about. So he says, you leave that. You leave certain things. Because under normal circumstances, under natural circumstances, without anybody pushing it on us, we have imbibed the spirit and the trend of the world like a sponge that has taken in the sea water. It is there. It is inbuilt. We quickly gather all this rubbish from here and there. This is spreads faster than sick, uh, uh, health, isn't it? Suppose you are healthy, you go and sit near somebody, you, that fellow does not become healthy. But if that fellow is sick, you go near him, you get the sickness. No, that is the formula. That is why, how it is. That is that nature. So that is why there is a deliberate call that is given to us. You lay aside all malice, all hypocrisy, all evil speaking, all guile. You throw it out. Because they are all things of the world. Now we are coming to the word. Beloved, Christian life has to be continually a process of unlearning and learning. Without unlearning, there can be no proper learning. Unlearning precedes learning. Unlearning is difficult though. Because, you know, you cherish lots of things and then throw it out. Oh, no, no, we don't want to do it. We want to keep the Ishmael. We don't want to throw him out because that's also the offspring of our body, our strength. So we want to just keep him. At least give him an outer house. Why drive him away? So it is always very natural. You know, we like to just keep it with us. But God says, throw away that old things of the world because I want you now come into the fellowship of dining on the word. You know, that makes a lot of difference. The word and the word are highly opposed to each other. That is why most of us know it by heart. The very first song. Suppose somebody is asked to give us a 150 chapter book. I for one being a writer would not begin the first sentence of that book of 150 chapters who walks not, stands not, sits not. Very negative, huh? Very negative. But that's how this psalm begins. Blessed is the man who walks not in the way of the ungodly, who stands not in the way of sinners, and who sits not in the seat of the scornful for what? It's a preparation. It's unlearning. For what? But whose delight is in the law of the Lord, who meditates in the word of God day and night. In other words, don't go to verse 2 and 3 of Psalm 1 without doing your homework of verse number 1. That's why I said, you know, that unlearning always precedes that proper learn. You leave those things out. Unless you leave those things out, unless you remove those things out, you won't be able to properly respond to what God has to give to you from His Holy Word. That was not only the experience of David, that was experience of Prophet Jeremiah also. 
Turn with me to the book of Jeremiah, 15th chapter. You know, all these truths are consistent. Whenever there is an important truth given to us in God's word, it is said more than once. I will read to you verses 16 and 17 of Jeremiah 15. Your words were found and I ate them. Your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. And I am called by your name, O Lord of hosts. This is wonderful. But he also says what he threw away from his life. Look at the 17th word. I did not sit in the assembly of the mockers, nor did I rejoice. That's what exactly David said there. Blessed is the man who walks not, who stands not, and who sits not. Now this man, he says, the moment I received your word, I ate them. I did not sit in the seat of the mockers. I did not rejoice with them. You know, Bible is always parallel. Truth is always parallel. One passage of the scripture always explains the other passage of the scripture. The Bible is the Bible's best commentary. One passage throws light on another passage. This is why we have reference Bibles and this is why we should use the reference in our reference Bibles. It just explains. Scripture explains Scripture. A question was asked in an adult Sunday school class. What is spiritual growth? You know, big papers were distributed to the participant and they were asked to write down. What exactly is spiritual growth? Now just imagine, I'm giving out a bit of, bit of paper to each of you and I'm asking you to write, what is spiritual growth? And I don't want you to give you a big lecture. I want you to give me just two or three lines. You have to explain what spiritual growth means. Now most of us don't have a clear idea of what spiritual growth is. But you know what spiritual growth is? Spiritual growth is nothing but growing in the knowledge of the Lord. It's nothing but growing in the knowledge of the Lord. Let us become very tangible, beloved. Let's not remain too abstract too long. It will not take us anywhere. Let it be tangible. Let it be touchable. Christian growth is nothing but growing in the knowledge of the Lord. Where do you get the knowledge of the Lord? But from the word of the Lord but from the word of the Lord. Apart from the scriptures, where do you get to know the Lord? We talk about the word of God. I'm talking about the God of the word. It's called the word of God. When you read the word of God, you get to get to know the God of the word. That's why Apostle Paul so emphatically and categorically he said, you know what? That I may know him. Not I may know it. Not one experience. Not just one fragmentation of the truth. That I may know Him. You know, this should be the pursuit of pursuits of our life. We should be hunting after that. We should be panting after that, if you want to use that uh, psalmist verse. Panting. Not just, not, not just desiring. Panting. It is passionately going after it. That's the right word. What for? That I may know Him. I want to know Him. Anything else I am not satisfied with. This experience, that experience, this blessing, that blessing. Oh, they are all, they come and go. But Him. That's why Jesus Christ underwrote to, my, underwrote to a mouse. When He was talking to the two disciples after resurrection. He gave them an experience of hot glowing or burning within them. How did it happen? What was the sermon that made them to burn their hearts so much with joy? Very simple. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets and the scriptures, he explained to them what was written concerning himself. That's it. So what was the sermon? What was the sermon that the Lord Jesus Christ preached to them on the road to Emmaus, to the two disciples? Very simple. Beginning with Moses, running through all the prophets. In other words, Jesus, the Bible that Jesus had was 39 books of the Old Testament. So all through the 39 books, Psalms and wisdom books and prophecies, everything, he explained to them whatever was written concerning himself. That only made them to glow with a burning excitement and sensation. This is possible only if 
we do painstaking study of God's word. How much time, beloved, I want to come very close to you and ask this question. How much time do you spend on an average with a study, unhurried study of God's word? Now, you need to answer the question to yourself. You need to answer that question yourself. How much time we spend to yearn bread? How much time do we spend to cook bread? And how much time we spend to eat bread? No, this is the question. No, we, we need to be logical. I don't, I, I don't believe in being vague. You know, basically being an engineer, I believe in mathematics. Let's not be vague. Let, let's be very clear. How much time we spend in our life to earn bread, to cook bread, and to eat bread? But how much time we spend on an average, on a daily basis, for the study of God's word? What did Jesus Christ say? Man shall not live by that chapati alone. Did not Jesus say that? Did not Jesus say that? but by every word, every word, every word. That means it's not a, just a casual reading, but every word. It's an analytical, close study. That's what it means. Every word, word by word, painstaking, unhurried study of God's word. It is that which will give that man not only just sustenance and not only just maintenance, but also he will be growing like mighty calves in the stall. I call every one of you who has gathered here this morning with such enthusiasm to worship the Lord and to fellowship with God's people and meditate God's word. That from this day onwards, you will set aside some quality time every week. Quality time. Underline my words. Quality time every week where you will not be disturbed by any other mundane details of life. Mundane details of life. I want to tell you, beloved, everything in life looks important, but everything in life is not necessary. Until and unless you understand the difference between the word important and necessary, you are doomed in your Christian life. Everything is important. That's important. This is important. There is nothing unimportant in our lives. Everything is important. Everything is special. That is the trend of the day. Everything is important. But I'm not talking about what is important. I'm talking about what is necessary. Cooking for Jesus is important. If Martha had not cooked that day, Jesus would have been fasting that day. So she was not committing any sin there. She was not watching television, the latest movie of M.G. Ramachandra. What was she doing? She was after all cooking for Jesus. Sometimes we just dumb her as if uh, she was doing some non, not, 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 naughty business and something that was totally unnecessary and inappropriate. No. What she was doing was important. Jesus would go hungry and empty and everybody would be going hungry and empty that day. So what she was doing was important. But what Mary was doing was what was necessary. You need to learn to differentiate between what is important in life and what is necessary in life. It is that which is going to decide the quality of your Christian life. Thank God for the study Bibles we have. Thank God for all the study materials that we have. Yesterday I just briefly uh, walked into the uh, uh, book house of the Bible Society. I was fascinated. One or two copies of certain Bibles, which I am not able to get anywhere in India, they are available here. Beautifully arranged. So they are all available here. Every time you come here for a service, every time you walk into this campus, Please do visit that bookstore of the Bible Society. There are so many things you can pick up, especially study Bibles and the latest study aids. And update your biblical knowledge and scholarship. Get at least one study Bible. Get one NIV study Bible. Get one NASV study Bible. The latest is NLT study Bible. And still the latest is ESV study Bible. Go to the Bible Society. Ask them. They are some of the best biblical material that is available in the Christian uh, literature market today. 
and I very strongly recommend that you buy them and take time to study them. Don't simply buy them and then go to the next shop and get a Bible zip cover and zip it and don't open it because the zip will be spoilt if you frequently open it. You know, I don't know who invented that zip. Get these study materials and study them that you may grow thereby. Just like a baby will be craving for that sincere milk, that mother's milk craving. Even after if it is full, after 5-10 minutes, it will again cry milk. You know, that's the tenderness, they're babies. But we mothers will have to say, no, 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 every two hours only, every three hours only, there is modern. But those days it was not like that. Any time is milk time. Craving, that's what example, that's the illustration. Just like a newborn babe, not even a grown-up child, a newborn babe craving, it doesn't have regulation. It craves for that milk. That should be our craving for the word of God, that you may grow thereby. Spiritual birth, spiritual growth, then comes spiritual ministry. We'll go to stage number three. Spiritual ministry. First Peter chapter 4, I will read to you the 11th words. Here he's, he's talking about various ministries and the ministerial gifts. I can read even from verse 10. Each one has received a gift, minister to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And then he illustrates it by various gifts. He starts with, if anyone speaks or if anyone preaches, of if anyone teaches, if anyone shares, let him speak as the word or the utterance or the oracles of God. You know, there are so many ministries he talks about, but he first talks about this preaching or teaching or exhorting. He says, if anyone speaks, let him not speak out of his imagination. Did he not speak from whatever the best of experiences that he had? Let him speak according to the oracles of God. Let him preach the word of God. Beloved, these are days where from most of the pulpits you get anything but the pure word of God. People talk about experiences. People talk about visions. People talk about dreams. Or they talk about their latest trip to the Holy Land. Beloved, these things are not going to fill you. They are all just, uh, it's like uh, sugar candy. They are all like this uh, cotton candy. It looks big and beautiful, but it's not going to fill you. The solid word of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God, as the word of God. I like your handbill. It says revival meetings and then there is a beautiful text that is given there preach the word I don't know how many of you noticed it now I did not dictate all that to group of them but I'm very happy that he has got that uh, that wavelength that wavelength is there I'm able to see that preach the word thank you for the committee which was able to pick up that word preach the word you know why there is a famine for the word of God everywhere as prophet Amos said, there is a famine for the word of God. It is not a famine for bread. That means it is not a famine for material blessings. Rich, rich, abundant material blessings. But it is a famine for the hearing of the word of God. A lot of sermons also we have, but where is the message? You know, when somebody is preaching, you will know whether there is a message that is coming out or not. You know how you know it? You have got a mechanism, built-in mechanism. That will tell you. That will tell you. I don't need to keep on saying, I am preaching God's word, I am preaching God's word. If I preach God's word, you will know it. There is an anointing that is inside it. That will tickle. That will tell you, oh, here comes the word. Here comes the message. And you will be able to catch it. You will be able to tune it up. 
So if any man does a thing, let it be according to the word of God. Beloved, we are all doing ministry somewhere or other. Either we are directly involving ourselves in a ministry or we are helping somebody else who is doing a ministry. But whoever does whatever ministry, if it is not according to the word of God, it will collapse. I don't find any better word. Very sorry. I might sound blunt this morning. Better to be blunt than to be deceptive. Apostle Paul very clearly said, I have laid the foundation. Another man is building on it. Somebody is building with silver and gold and precious stones. But others are building with hay and stubble and wood. With hay, wood and stubble, you can build fast. In America, you can build houses in one week. But in India, to build one column, it takes one month. That's all wood. But this is solid concrete. A lot of difference. To just build a house and to bring down a house in states, it takes just less than one week. Very fast you can build it. But with gold and silver and precious stones, it takes time. And the last day, the fire is going to test it. What is that fire? It's not my word. Fire, says the Lord. So God is going to turn that fumes of fire across all our building construction. All the structures, the ministerial structures that we have built. If it stands, that man will get his reward. But if it melts away, that fellow will be saved as though by fire. Very narrow escape. Leave alone the reward. For him itself, it will be a very narrow escape. The day will declare it. What happens today is not going to declare it. That day will declare it. There was Moses. Oh, people were murmuring. We want water. We are thirsty. God told him, speak to the mountain. But he would not speak to the mountain. He struck the mountain. I have a question for you. If you know the Bible, you answer that question. God commanded Moses to speak to the mountain. Instead of speaking to the mountain, Moses struck the mountain. I have a question. Did water come out or not? Were people blessed or not? Not only people, even their animals had enough to drink. Just because there is a blessing, it doesn't mean it is a God-approved ministry. The end does not justify the means. It is not what you do that is important. It is how to do it that is important. It is not the size of the work that matters. It is the thought of the work that matters. Are you with me? The day will declare it. And God told Moses, Moses, I am very sorry, your visa to the Holy Land is cancelled. I only stamped it, but now I am just removing it. Is such a heinous crime? Is it such a worst thing? No, I am sorry. You are not done according to my word, because whatever you are doing now, I am going to write it in the Bible, and that is going to be for generations. How serious I am for somebody who does my ministry, to do everything according to my word, I am going to establish an eternal lesson. Don't worry, you won't come to the Holy Land, but you'll come to heaven. But nevertheless, that was a punishment. A man whom God chose, unusual prophetic leadership, never a man like that as was knowing God face to face like Moses. Even God himself testified. But he was not able to, he was able to bring people out of Egypt. He was not able to take people into the promised land. It's all because he was not ready to listen to the word of God. If any man speaks, if any man ministers, let him minister according to the word of God. Not everyone who comes to me and says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Did he not prophesy? Did he not work miracles? They do not cast out demons. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. It is not God's work. It is God's will we are talking about. Where is God's will? God's word. 
Now, I'm going pretty fast because I assume that this congregation is reasonably a mature congregation. We can quickly catch up what I'm trying to explain. Spiritual birth, spiritual growth, spiritual ministry, and then comes spiritual maturity, the fourth aspect. Growing in our character, growing in our nature, our behavior, not just the belief, but also the behavior, how we live. Second Peter, first chapter, I'll read to you verses 3 and 4. Second Peter, first chapter, verses 3 and 4. As His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, underline, promises of God's word, exceedingly great and precious promises. What for all those promises? That through these, through these means what? Through these promises, you may be partakers of the divine nature. Underline that word, divine nature. You may be partakers of divine nature. You may become like God's very nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world. You know, people talk about promises. That's good. There are so many promises in the Bible. The Bible itself is a promise. So you don't need to simply close the Bible, open the Bible, keep the Bible. That itself is promise. The Bible is full of promise. In the Garden of Eden there was promise. And in the last book of the last page of the Bible also there is promise. There is promise everywhere. You can't find one single page in the Bible where there is no promise. It's full of promises. But there is a promise of promises. You know what is that? We can be partakers of the divine nature. We can become like Jesus. We can be partakers of the divine nature. I tell you, this is why I am proud to be a Christian. No other religion has got this message. I am proud to be a Christian. Only in Christianity I can become like the God whom I worship. I can share His very nature. And how does it happen? Through these precious promises. Because every time I read the word of God, I am exposed. Follow me carefully. Very dangerous. Every time I read the word of God, we will very easily say I am encouraged. But in, be getting encouraged is one side of the coin. There is another side of the coin. I am not only getting encouraged, I am getting exposed. Many people don't read the Bible. You know why? Every time they read the Bible, the Bible reads them. It's a mirror. It is a mirror. It is better than the Belgian mirror. You know, sometimes, you know, you go to the show, you know, that's why I tell uh, my friends, you know, whenever you go to buy a mirror, don't take a lady with you. Because ladies would like to have a mirror which will show them slim and tall. The true picture, if it's a real mirror, if it is a mirror without any waves, they don't like it. You know, some kind of a thing. The true picture, but the word of God doesn't have any wavy thing. There is no, it is not wavy in its surface. It's better than the Belgian mirror, beautifully coated. It exposes me. How far does it go in exposing me? It is sharper than gillet. It is sharper than gillet. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. You talk about your words. God not only talks about your thoughts, He talks about the intents of your thoughts also. It says, the word of God is so sharp, it can divide between thoughts and intents. None of us can do. People can't even make out our thoughts. They go duped by the words that we speak. But God not only looks at our thoughts, He also can go incisively inside 
The nearest you can talk about is the surgeon's scalpel. It cuts right across. And you know, I, every time I read that beautiful text in the book of Hebrews, it says, it uh, divides the marrow from the bones. You know, dividing the marrow from the bone is not easy. It's an illustration, but it's not easy. Even if you well cook the bone, the marrow will not easily come out. I don't know about you, you know, those days we used to have this, uh, you know, Sunday afternoon is the lunch time and that's the time we get mutton at home and we get that bone and we try to keep on sucking it, nothing comes out, then we keep on doing it, and nothing pours out. Then we give it to mommy, mommy immediately takes it to the grinding stone and she just uh, uh, tries to crush it and it jumps like a marble. You know, to get that marrow out of that boiled bone. It's not easy. It will be very unseemly, but you know, it's a happy remembrance. Every time I read that, I come across our modern young people will not be able to understand that. It's because it is given in that Eastern custom. But the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword that can just be, take out. So sharp. Beloved, thank God we have a book that tells us who we are. Everybody else speaks lies. Your wife does not tell the truth to you. Because if your wife tells you the truth, you will be upset with her. The husband does not tell the truth to the wife. She comes and stands before you. How am I darling in this dress? You have to say very nice. You can't tell the truth. We are living in that kind of the world. We are, we are trained to speak untruth in a palatable way. That's what it is. But thank God, this Bible. You know, we need to really, really thank God with our hearts filled with tears. We need to thank God. At last in this corrupt world, when truth is slain and lain on the streets, we have a word in our hand which tells us the truth. Amen? Amen. That's what we should thank God for. That is why the Bible says the word of God is the word of truth. There's a beautiful name that is given to the scriptures. The word of truth. So it shows me who I am and how I walk, where I am wrong, no compromise. You can't keep changing it. The Bible cannot be updated because the Bible is always up to date. Anything else needs to be updated, but the Bible cannot be, need not be, should not be. It is already up to date. It tells me where I am. It convicts me. It doesn't convict me for condemnation. It convicts me for conversion. Simon Peter was convicted for conversion. Whereas Judas Iscariot, the religion, it convicted him for condemnation. But those who are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. There is conviction, but no condemnation. The word of God does not condemn us. It only convicts us. So be bold. Don't hesitate to expose yourself to the word of God that opens up its beam of light and rush into the darkest recesses of your life. What for? Not to make you feel guilty or condemned, but to convict you and to correct you and come out of where you are. Blessed be the name of the Lord for his beautiful word. The fifth stage of our Christian life as we keep maturing in our Christian character, there comes times of darkness. Nobody is spared of it. There comes times of darkness, times of suffering, times of puzzle. The word of God helps us there too. Again, Second Peter. You know, the whole thing is from Second Peter. First chapter, I'll read to you verses 19. Second Peter, first chapter, verses 19 and 20 and 21. We have the prophetic word made more sure, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place, as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. What is that light he is talking about? 
the very next words he says no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit beloved I referred to this season as the Lenten season oh that last week in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ was stuck with horror Jesus did not tell a lie he said no oh, my soul is sorrowful unto death you want to call it negative confession call it it was not I'm not talking about negative or positive it is a real confession my soul is sorrowful unto death there is anguish and there is agony to think of what I'm going to suffer in the hands of the religious people and the Roman soldiers in the next few hours I'm crushed by that agony and Jesus said this is the hour of power of darkness but how could Jesus Christ sustain himself there was Peter in the garden of Gethsemane when the soldiers came to take hold of his master he was highly excited he drew his sword and he cut the right ear blade of the sexton of the high priest and immediately Jesus told Simon Peter put the sword back into his sheath everyone who takes the sword will fall by the sword do you think that I cannot pray to my father now when he would not immediately release a battalion of angels on my behalf I can do it but I would not because I want to live by the word how then the scripture will be fulfilled that these things must happen You're talking about hour of darkness you are talking about horror that is coming on your life your question unanswered all puzzles more questions than answers getting more and more complicated heaven looks like a brass everything is like a flint no answer whatever you pray gets reflected back on you the best of friends whom you trusted they miserably fail you don't get angry with them God is making them to sleep you wake them up they will not only sleep they will snore he removes all the human props from your life you can't trust in your friends you can't trust in yourself you can trust only in the one who is able to resurrect you left alone even angels will not be there how do I say even angels were not there around after Jesus committed and said okay father let your will be done it is after that when he sweated blood drops then an angel appeared and strengthened him until then he was left alone he was left alone no, no not even an angelic company nevertheless he was standing on the word of God he stood on the word of God like a lion whom do you want to take Jesus I am he I am he how can the scripture be fulfilled beloved in times of darkness depend on the word of God that is why David very correctly said if your word had not been my delight I would have perished in my afflictions if your word had not been my delight I would have perished in my afflictions but in the house of my pilgrimage your word had been my songs of delight sixthly as we just grow through these times of darkness even as we keep maturing in the knowledge of the Lord there comes a time when we find even our knowledge becoming inadequate to handle the situations of life we think oh now we have learnt all these lessons we can easily handle you find the next trial in life defeats all the knowledge that you had earned earlier <laughs> one wave comes you duck in oh 
This wave I have managed. No wave can be higher and taller than this wave. Only to find the next wave is still taller and higher and it gushes you and finishes you. One after the other. One after the other. One after the other. Which of us can say your problems are over? If you say that, that will be the greatest lie ever told. Somebody told you, come to Christ, your problems will be solved. You believed that lie? Your problems did not stop or get solved. Your problems started after coming to Jesus. That is the right gospel. Your knowledge becomes very imperfect. We don't know. We are not able to understand. Many things we are not able to understand. At that time, we have to join Peter who rightly said. Second Peter, third chapter, verses 15 and 16. You know how he was maturing with the word of the Lord. He says, account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. It is not simply Paul, it is brother Paul. No, 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 it is not brother Paul, it is beloved brother Paul. No, 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 it is not beloved brother Paul, our beloved brother Paul. Come on, Peter and Paul were rivals. <laughs> they would dash with the, against each other, clash with each other. But now it is Peter saying, our beloved brother Paul. According to the wisdom that God has given him, as in all his epistles, speaking in them of the things, some are hard to understand. Appa. Peter to make this statement, because earlier he thought he could speak on every imaginable subject on the face of the earth. He would even tell his master, Oh Lord, no, you don't understand. This should not happen to you. He was a counselor to the Lord at one point of time. At least he was trying to be. And at one point he said, Oh Jesus, God, you are backslidden. These are unclean things. Unclean things you are not supposed to eat. What happened to you? You are backslidden? No, no, no. Take back. That is the kind of person Peter was. But now he says, certain things are hard to understand. Beloved, the more you walk with the Lord and the more you study the word, the more you will realize what you know is much less than what you ought to know. That's real Christian life. Because there is so much God's wisdom. You begin to realize His ways are higher than my ways and His thoughts are higher than my thoughts. I cannot bring Him into a small mathematical, uh, algebraical formula. No, such things don't work. He's beyond all that. Oh, the wisdom of God. Who can be his counselor? Now that's the maturity that we are still coming. That means I want to read the word more. I want to read the word more. Even more and more I want to read. Because I am yet to know. And Apostle Paul, even towards the end of his life, even talking about the gifts of the Spirit, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, you know what he said? Our knowledge is imperfect. That's the maturity. Our knowledge is imperfect. Seventhly and lastly, as we still keep going, because the time is running out, I'm not able to spend enough time, but I believe you can easily make out because I've given you enough explanation. As we still keep going, still our conscience keeps bothering us. We grow tired and exhausted. Because the world is going from bad to worse. Corruption becomes the order of the day. Things do not get any better. Somebody tells us the best is yet to be, but the truth is the worst is yet to be. Second Peter, third chapter, verses 9 and 13. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. Well, how long, Lord? Beloved, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count it slackness, but he is long suffering. Nevertheless, come to verse 13. We, according to his promise, underline that word promise again, his word, we, according to his promise, 
we look for the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells in other words in the old heaven and old earth where we are living not righteousness only unrighteousness ungodliness and corruption that only dwells that's the order of the day but we are looking forward to the new heaven and new earth which will be characterized by righteousness of God God is going to do it will things become better may or may not be I for one who believe on the face of the scriptures the things are not going to become better the love of many will wax cold the faith of many will begin to dwindle but the Lord is still on the throne and he is going to bring us that new heaven and new earth where only righteousness will dwell you know think of a place where only righteousness will dwell and how do you know that the word of the Lord promises that so beginning with salvation beginning with our new birth till the ushering in of the new heaven and new earth we have this full word of God which will stand forever and ever anything may come and go anything may come through or not but the word of the Lord shall abide forever and ever the pulpit that I preach from this podium this lectern this is temporal this microphone this is temporal the seats that you are sitting on they are temporal anything that you see today is temporal with one exception the Bible that we see today is eternal Jesus said heaven and earth shall pass away which heaven which he created heaven and earth shall pass away but the word of the Lord shall not pass away not even a dot of it not even a jot of it if you believe that keep your Bibles open and stand up in the presence of God to declare it lift up your Bibles in your right hand keep your eyes closed and your heads lifted up and your Bibles on your right hand lifted up we'll sing that beautiful old Sunday school chorus the B I B L E yes that's the book for me I stand alone on the word of God the B I B L E once again lifting up your holy Bibles the B I B L E yes that's the book for me I stand alone on the word of God the B I B L E gracious Heavenly Father we thank you for the word of God that you have given to us the blessing of blessings the gift of gifts but we are sorry Lord we have not given the due place to the study meditation of your word in our lives forgive us O oh God help us to bring the Bible back to his due place in our lives individually as families and corporately as a fellowship thank you for all that we have meditated today from the first and the second epistles of Simon Peter who gave the right place and the due place to your word in his life and calling we commit ourselves to the word of your grace in Jesus name we pray everybody say Amen, amen. now here is uh, the pastor with the word of benediction amen.